us and then we'll have some time at the end for questions. Perfect. Thanks so much, Janet. Uh, and thank you all for joining. If I can get a quick thumbs up if you can see my screen. Learned that one in March 2020 and have not let that go, just like an easy way. I have done full presentations thinking I had a screen shared and did not. So thank you for bearing with my anxiety. Um, all right, so excited to um, have you all join in today and to talk specifically about the University of Memphis University Schools. My name is Josh Zubrick, and I'm our Director of Academic Operations, and we'll get a little bit more into what that means here momentarily. Um, right now, I have about 15 people on, which is exciting, and I anticipate that we'll have people, given the inclement weather, joining or hopping off at various times. And so, uh, as Janet mentioned, what we will do is just go through specifically helping to familiarize everybody on the call about university schools. Uh, we'll finish with our current research that is occurring at our schools, and then we'll open it up to uh, more broad questions or inquiries from folks that can help give you a full understanding. Um, if at any point you've got questions, I think the most helpful way is just to drop them into the chat. Um, and then what I will do is just be able to quickly scan, know if we're going to be uh, having that question covered, um, or at least being able to keep record of those questions for when we get to the question and answer. Cool. Um, all right. So University of Memphis University Schools um, is a brand that is about five years old uh, now that we're in 2023. And for about 100 years, everybody knew us uh, separately as Campus School and then the Barbara K. Lipman ELRC. And so we're going to get a bit into what does it mean when we talk about university schools at the University of Memphis. All right, so we are six schools and we are one compendium. And when we think about a compendium, we are a compendium of schools that starts at six weeks old and currently goes through ninth grade, but within the next three years, we'll go through 12th grade as we prepare our students for career or college aspirations. We have four schools that we directly manage the day-to-day -day operations for, and that's the ELRC, which is formally known as the Barbara K. Lipman School. ELRC, we'll get into more, but stands for the Early Learning Research Center. We have Campus School, which is our elementary school that serves students in kindergarten through fifth grade. We have University Middle School, which serves students in sixth through eighth grade. And then we have University High School, which serves ninth grade currently, 10th grade next year, and then we'll have ninth through 12th grade uh, by the time that our founding class gets to their senior year of high school. We have two school partnerships currently. One is with Porter Leith at the Porter Leith University of Memphis Early Learning Academy in Orangebound. So if you've ever driven down Park Avenue and you've noticed a really pretty looking village thing that is next to Melrose High School, um, that is what we call Plum. And that is short for Porter Leith University of Memphis. And they serve about 300 students and six years old through pre-K. Uh, and then Harwood is our um, Special Needs Center, which is located on South Campus off of Park Avenue, um, and Harwood serves about 30 students with special needs, primarily autistic students. Okay. So that is the compendium, four direct-run schools and two school partnerships. Um, if you ask yourself, what does it mean to be a school partnership? We are still figuring that out. Um, and so a few things that we do with Plum is we help manage the research that occurs at Plum the internships, the observations with the College of Ed. We have a full-time person there. Uh, and then with Harwood, uh, Dr. Parrish and I both serve on the Harwood Nonprofits Board of uh, Directors. And then we are just thought partners with them. And then there are just multiple times that because they're on the University of Memphis campus, they might not know that they could take advantage of a particular department um, or partnership. And so we just help steer them in that direction. But they are the experts in terms of special education. Um, Plum is really the experts in terms of the day-to-day -day running of a 300 child early learning center. Um, and we are excited to support them as we can. All right, so our history, uh, technically university schools history predates the universe, uh, University of Memphis. And so we do say that we were founded in 1912. 
Uh, technically, we were founded in 1910 uh, as a classroom where we had a multi-age classroom, and they decided that here in the frontiers of West Tennessee, they should probably train some teachers. And so they would bring children and drop them off in the classroom, and then people would practice on our children and then go off to Brownsville or Fayette or all of the different places, the Ville's all over West Tennessee, which is exciting. Um, if you are familiar with the founding of the university, we were not the only higher education training center. There was about 17 that were simultaneously happening across the city. And so the state of Tennessee said, hey, we should probably try to wrangle them in and bring them in under an umbrella. And those 17 programs got wrangled in to become the West Tennessee uh, Normal School. Um, we have a really proud history. Uh, we just met with the university schools at East Tennessee State here two weeks ago. They came and toured our schools and we got to share notes, which was fine. Um, but really, I think the best way to think about it is while well, you might have a Florida and Florida State or a Virginia and Virginia Tech and other states, we have Tennessee and then we really had four Tennessee states. We had Tennessee State Nashville, East Tennessee State, Middle Tennessee State, uh, and then West Tennessee State, now the University of Memphis, really to be able to spread out and do teacher training across a very long state that we have. And so that's really how I try to explain it to folks. Um, but we're really excited here um, that we were founded in 1912. Um, in 1947, while we were excited about having elementary school, the Barbara K. Lipman uh, Center was founded to help serve uh, the university community with preschool. So they are celebrating um, their 75th, now going to 76th year. Uh, they are located right behind the Scheidt School of Music's new beautiful building on Central on Poplar Avenue. Fast forward a really long time, we start university schools because what we heard was a demand from families at campus school where they say, we finish, we finish elementary, and then you all just kind of cut us to the wind, right? Like, where do we go for middle? Where do we go for high? And so we really thought about what does that partnership look like for us to be able to create a bridge from elementary school all the way to starting as a freshman at the University of Memphis. And so in 2019, University Middle School started um, in the proud basement of East High School off of Poplar Avenue. Um, and then due to facility concerns, um, East was wonderful, the people were wonderful. That building is very old and their basement is older. Uh, so that was exciting. And so we moved to the Orgel Center, which is formerly known as the Fogelman Executive Center across the street from the Fogelman College of Business and Economics and also Caddy Corner to uh, the Holiday Inn. Um, 2020, we Harwood joined us uh, at the University of Memphis. They had been at a location out in Cordova and they moved into their new facility, which is beautiful. Um, and then the Porter Leaf Partnership started in 2021. And then uh, this fall, about five months ago, University High School started. Uh, and we have a lovely 97 freshmen on our campus. And they bring all of the trials and travails that you would imagine 14 and 15 year old freshmen bring. Um, so we're excited. Again, what we're going to do in this presentation is go over more closely what those four direct run schools are and what their details are. Um, so overall, we uh, will have about 1,000 students, um, a little north of 1,000 students uh, for next school year. We serve directly students starting at age two at the ELRC all the way through 10th grade next year at four direct run schools. Um, our student body is 51% white, 49% non-white, with the vast majority of those students being identifying as Black or African American. Our average class size is 20 to 1. However, the ELRC don't panic. Uh, it is four to one uh, student to adult ratio with the little littles. Um, we had this slide at an ELRC event and parents were like, what? No, we're like, no, no, there will be other adults in the room. <laughs> okay, we're good. Um, we have all of the supports through Memphis Shelby County Schools for our IDEA uh, supported disciplines, uh, for our gifted, talented students, um, our students with, uh, diagnoses that would require them to have an IEP. And our largest diagnosis group is autism. So we have a high um, autistic student population um, across ELRC, campus, university middle, and university high. But our students receive speech, OT, physical therapy, 
um, special education, most of our special ed, and we can get into that as well, um, is done in the room inclusion in their least restrictive environment. We do have some resource pull out though uh, for students that need it, in, again, in their individual education plan. <laughs> Finally, we have really rich extracurriculars. Uh, we have four full-time extracurricular teachers at campus school. They call themselves LAMP for Library Art Music PE. Um, we have a really robust extracurricular program at University Middle and High, including full-time Spanish, full-time Mandarin, um, and our Mandarin teacher has her master's in education from the University of Beijing um, and in like, Chinese language studies. Um, sorry, I love to brag about that because I went into her class the second week and it's like, oh, this is like real Mandarin, right? Like this is like, I have no idea what's happening in here. Um, and so really exciting there. Um, but again, I think one thing that is different from past places I have been is having full-time extracurricular faculty on staff, so not part-time people or having to contract out with a nonprofit. This is our team. Um, we are led by Dr. Sally Parrish, who is our Associate Vice President of Educational Initiatives and leads our department, along with Kelsey Ryan, who's on here in the Center for Service Learning over at the um, UC. And then we have four executive directors. We have Brooke Willis, who runs the day-to-day -day operations at the ELRC, as well as manages our partnerships with Porter Leith, First Eight, and Harwood. We have Dr. Rebecca Scott, who is a staple and pillar of the campus school community, and she is our executive director, aka principal there. We have Kareth Griffin, uh, who's our executive director at University Middle. We have Dr. Uh, Crystal Hodges Johnson, who's our executive director of University High. And then we have me, uh, and I'm our director of academic operations. And so I manage our seven person central team and then provide support and coaching to our four executive directors. We're going to get into each of the schools, but I want to pause and honor that you may have questions before we get into each school specifics about the compendium overall. Um, I can let you know if you ask the questions, I can either answer them or I'll let you know if we're going to cover it later in the conversation. So I'll pause there and give us a minute in case people want to ask a burning question. Okay, let's keep going. All right, the ELRC is where we're gonna start. We're gonna go chronological in age from our youngest set of students all the way to our oldest set of students. So the early, the early Learning and Research Center, uh, again, has been at the University of Memphis since 1947. It serves to students starting, you can begin the day you turn two. So the day you turn two, you can become an ELRC student. We have a, what we like to say, healthy and robust waiting list. We don't reveal our waiting list numbers, but I can ensure that it is healthy and robust. Um, we have people that buy right when they give birth to their baby, which is great. Um, I'm always like, make sure that you are taking care of yourself before you apply, but awesome to have you on the wait list. They are a NACI accredited uh, institution and they are recognized by the Tennessee Department of Education. We are a private school for the ELRC. Um, we are a private school that is tuition run, uh, which is the way that early learning happens in the universe or in the Tennessee sector for early childhood. That said, we do have uh, early, sorry, we do have voluntary pre-K. Um, so that is free pre-K um, with no tuition uh, in one of our classrooms uh, and have up to 20 seats there. And we're working to expand that. And that is uh, run in partnership with a nonprofit here called First Eight, who's our supervisor of our tuition free pre K program. Uh, but again, that program um, has a family gross income cap. And so I don't, I believe it's a family must make $40,000 or less in order to be eligible to attend uh, that classroom. Again, we start at two years old we technically go through kindergarten. And you might say, what do you mean by that? Um, and so we have one Montessori classroom. That Montessori classroom has six three-year-olds, six four-year-olds, and six kindergartners. And the idea is that you stay in that classroom for three years, three, four, and kindergarten. 
and then they are eligible to transfer uh, for first grade to campus school. So instead of doing kindergarten campus school, they would stay and do Montessori campus school, or sorry, Montessori kindergarten at ELRC. There are 105 students at the ELRC. They have an average four to one ratio. So we have about 25 to 26 full-time staff members at the ELRC. And then their demographics for their particular campus are 53% white, 47% BIPOC. We have three demonstration classrooms. Um, so we have a lot of classrooms at the ELRC, but there are three demonstrations. We have the Montessori demonstration. And again, that's a multi-age classroom with a lot of student-led learning, if you're familiar with the Maria Montessori model. We have the Reggio Emilia, which is a really, again, a student-led model, but a bit different um, than Montessori. We have classrooms that are Reggio Emilia. And then finally, we have our university pre-K demonstration, which is that free income restricted, no tuition um, uh, pre-K. Finally, um, they do follow our calendar at the ELRC, but if anybody here has ever had a child, you know that you cannot leave a two-year-old at home by themselves during the summer, right? And so we do have year-round options. Um, our supervising faculty do get the summer off now. They have the option to work for additional money uh, for the summer camp, but the summer camp is super fun. I mean, if you can't tell by, based upon the photos, um, it is still academically engaging, but it's a little bit less academically intense than the year round. Um, and we take advantage of the soupy, you know, Memphis weather during the summer. And we just throw them outside and let them get all tired and then send them back to their family. Cool. We're going to transition. And so if you're going with me around campus, we were just right behind the Shite building for the School of Music up on Poplar, and now we're gonna go down Zach Curlin uh, to where it meets Walker, and that is where Campus School is. And so for Campus School, um, we are really, really excited about Campus's results. Um, they are once again, a reward school in the state of Tennessee, which means they are in the top 5% of schools um, in the state on proficiency, so not growth, like overall, how many kids passed ELA, math, science, and social studies. Beyond that, out of 1,556 schools in the state of Tennessee, campus school ranks number four in terms of proficiency. Okay. And they are also the most diverse of the top 100. All right. They are also recognized by the US Department of Education as a national blue ribbon school, and they are a STEM designated school in the Tennessee STEM Innovation Network. So if you ever talk to Dr. Rebecca Scott, she will share these things with you, but if you've ever met her, she is very humble. And so I tell her to keep the humility up and my job with the marketing and communications is to make sure people know about what is happening at campus school. Uh, campus school, uh, again, kindergarten through fifth grade. However, uh, kindergarten is only in its fourth year of existence at campus school. It used to be first through fifth grade, okay? Um, the enrollment is right at 398. Technically, that's wrong. We had seven students join us uh, after Christmas break, so we're actually at 405. We are 59% white at campus school, 41% Black Indigenous people of color um, in terms of identifying across lines of difference. Um, we will tell you that K-1 and 2 is more diverse than 3, 4, and 5. Um, having kindergartner as a start, kindergarten as a starting point has been helpful, and also having that voluntary pre-K um, income restricted pre-K um, as a feeder into uh, campus school has also been helpful in helping us diversify to match uh, the other university schools. Class size is about 20 to 1. Again, they have the full supports of the Memphis Shelby County Schools Department of Exceptional Children for anybody that um, has an individual education plan. And again, they're home to LAMP, Library, art, music, PE, very funny. They dress as lamps sometimes. It's great, good camaraderie. This is all their stats uh, for campus school. But again, they've been a state reward school multiple years. Um, I could go back further, but I decided 2011 was about as aggressive as I wanted to get on this slide. It doesn't need to look like the University of Alabama football department when you walk up and just see national championships everywhere. Again, they are number four out of 1,552 schools. Growth also, they were level five, which is the highest level of TVOS you can attain and across subgroups. 
Um, one question we get where people are like, can I ask it off the record? They're like, how do black students or uh, economically disadvantaged students do? I said, they do. They're not exactly where we would want them. There's still a gap for sure, but compared to their peers in Memphis Shelby County schools um, or the state writ large, uh, they are doing significantly stronger. And again, STEM designated school and Blue Ribbon School. We're going to go to our last building on campus. We're going to go over to the Orgel Educational Center, formerly the Fogelman Executive Center. Um, if you've ever been to the Fogelman Executive Center before it was redone, please come back. We got rid of all the 1980s shag carpet and we painted it and it doesn't smell um, anymore. We still, Marcos has an office. Marcus has joined, who's our assistant director of extended learning, and his office is in the soon to be redone fourth floor. And anytime I go up there, my allergies immediately flare. So please come by and your allergies won't flare because we've redone floors one, two, and three, which is exciting. Uh, so University Middle School, um, it is a project-based learning school. Um, and we currently follow the Buck Institute's gold standard for project-based learning. Um, we're really excited about it. We use a rotating block schedule where our students, um, they might, they see all of their classes three times a week for 75 minutes a session for a total of 225 minutes. What that means with rotating block is, for example, I am not a morning person. So I might go to my math class in the morning on Monday, midday on Wednesday, and in the afternoon on Thursday. So that way, uh, students and teachers see one another at different times of the day throughout the week. Um, I personally, uh, when I joined, had some doubts about whether an 11-year-old could master a rotating block schedule, um, and they can. It was really cool to watch. Within about two days, they know their full schedule. They know where they're going. Um, they don't go in lines. And so if you've been to a charter school or a Memphis Shelby County school or even some independent schools where you see kind of like rigid lines and kids walking in lines, that is not university middle, that is not university high. And so whenever we have visitors, they kind of like look a little nervous at first and then they're like, oh, children can, children can govern themselves. And what we think about is with trust and responsibility, come trust and responsibility, right? And so if you break the trust and responsibility and you need additional, we'll get there. But again, what we're trying to do at University Middle is really bridge the gap between campus school and university high. And we'll talk a bit more about university high and dual enrollment and trusting kids on campus. But if we can't trust you to transition from sixth grade at ELA to sixth grade math, in three years, how are we gonna trust you to literally walk across campus for a college class? And so that's the way that we try to think about uh, the way that we govern student um, activity and movement. Sixth through eighth grade, we have 270 students. We are 51% white, 49% BIPOC for students. Um, and then we're really proud that we are working on having a staff that reflects uh, the demographics of our students. And so we're 62% white, 38% BIPOC for our faculty and staff at University Middle. Um, and again, we have a really extensive extracurricular at the middle school level. Spanish, uh, Mandarin, we're working on adding French next year, PE, um, art, uh, orchestra, band, choir. So for a school of 270 students, I would argue that we have um, really the extracurricular athletics of what I traditionally see in like a thousand plus kid middle school. Um, and so I'm really always impressed by your university middle school faculty, staff, and leadership and what they can do with a smaller size school. Here are some pictures of athletics. Um, what we say about our athletics at University Middle and High, um, we are not seeking to be number one. We are more of a Vanderbilt in terms of our athletic department. We are excited to be there and we're excited to compete. Um, but what we tell kids is if you have a minimum number of students interested and you can find a coach, we will help you. We will get you uniforms. We will get you a practice space. Marcos is currently actually interviewing for our coordinator of athletic programs, and they will work across the four schools and they will report to Marcos. Um, but that's what we tell them. Um, now, our golf team came in second in high school in the district, and it's their first year with ninth graders. So, like, it doesn't mean that we want to be bad. We don't want to be bad, but we don't say like being competitive is the bar for which we say that you can have sports. We just want them to have fun. We want them to be sportsmanlike. 
Um, we've got a great legend for University High. They are ninth graders. They are playing varsity basketball this year against ninth through 12th schools. And in their first game, um, we'll leave the, the other school is very kind, but we lost 88 to 12. Um, and, but we had 10 blocks and I didn't even know what a block was, but they said that the other coach called a timeout at one point, called his team over and said, like, these are freshmen. When you play real teams, if they, like, you play like this, they're going to destroy. And we were like, hey, we're a real team. <laughs> you got to be nice to us. Like, come on, we're trying. Um, so that's really it. But we're really always proud of our students. Um, we're also proud that for the most part, our sports team's demographic shifts reflect that of the um, that of the school writ large. And so that's what we wanna see with our after school programs and voluntary programs is that we're not having students self-segregate when we do extracurriculars. <laughs> Finally, um, when I was putting this together, uh, Kareth was like, please make sure that you include the further elective options, including Kelsey is here. She teaches our electives um, two days a week, but this is a really cool opportunity so if you have somebody, including you or somebody in your department, who's like, man, I want to work with middle schoolers, right? We will get you set up. Um, we have debate, orchestra, I and mean, you can read it, Greek mythology, pottery, archery, and students all sign up. It meets on Wednesday and Friday mornings uh, for 75 minutes each. But our students take a semester-long course in an elective, and this is another opportunity outside of the Spanish, French, um, PE Mandarin, so it's more traditional electives, to take another set of electives uh, traditionally offered by graduate assistants or professors or department chairs across campus, as well as folks in the community who come in. And to finish at University High School, um, this is a small set, so we were able to get Wendy Adams uh, to take photographs last Friday, so this is our like sneak peek, it's like the sneak peek post day. Um, wedding. And so we got a few photos and it's like, these are immediately going onto this slideshow. So congrats on getting to see the sneak peek. Uh, but this is what University High School looks like. This is real lab equipment. So like we are not, we didn't like take them somewhere. This is like real lab equipment that they get to use. Um, but yeah, it's a pretty joyous place. Um, I had been around freshmen um, for a number of years because I've worked in places with high schools and our freshmen are different and they're different because there's no one older than them. Typically when I meet freshmen, they are like the small fish in a big pond and terrified and trying to figure out their sea legs. And that is not our freshmen. Our freshmen are like confident and leading the way, which is exciting. Um, and also exciting for our current eighth graders to become freshmen next year to kind of have some normal freshmen again who are afraid of things. That'll be nice. Um, so no, we're really excited to have all of our kiddos here. Um, next year, we'll have about 200 students, about 100 kids per grade. Um, they are at the high school level, 34% white, 66% BIPOC this year. Next year's number is looking at about 45% white, 55% BIPOC, 20 to 1 uh, average class size. Um, and again, we start dual enrollment. And I'm going to go to a slide in a moment that talks a bit about dual enrollment. Um, but dual enrollment is really the draw and focus of our program. We're really transparent with folks when they are looking at university high school or whether they want to stay about this is who we are, this is who we aren't, so that way people can make informed decisions about their high school selection. The way that we think about dual enrollment is our ninth graders don't take dual enrollment, period. They're just not ready. Um, as anybody, you know, you all know, if we put a 14-year-old in one of your classes or department's classes, you would call us and that would be it. Um, so we will at the earliest start our students who have met a series of thresholds in 10th grade with one dual enrollment class. It's kind of like when you go buy that new fish at PetSmart and you have to like leave them in the bag and like get them used to the water temperature of the tank, you know, we anticipate that the dual enrollment will meet at university high school, right? So we would bring people to the, to the high school and then starting in 11th grade, we can work going out in groups to a class and we are working on hiring graduate assistants uh, to be able to support that. But right now, the way that we think about things is we currently have 18 pathways for dual enrollment and each of these pathways will lead students to having up to 30 um, opportunity or 30 credit hours um, before they 
go to uh, hopefully the University of Memphis, but uh, a college or that they can take that and get towards their career certifications if they want to go straight into career. The way we think about this though is we have clusters of studies and we have six. We have business, communications, engineering, general health, and leadership. And then within each of these, we have three, three pathways and we have a rigorous pathway, a more rigorous pathway, and a most rigorous pathway. Please note that I did not say easy, medium, hard, because even our rigorous pathway is still college classes on a college campus for people that are below the age of 18. That is rigorous. But what we're trying to do here is we're thinking through with each of the departments that are represented in the blue icons on the left, what are the appropriate course sequences that our students should be taking in dual enrollment that align both with the University of Memphis course catalog, the TBR overall course catalog, let's say they wanted to go over to Johnson City and go to East Tennessee State or go to Tennessee State in Nashville, or what's the University of Tennessee course catalog look like and they wanted to go to Chat Martin or Knoxville. And so we're trying to think through if a kid is going into engineering and they want to major in mechanical engineering, how can we help them take 30 credit hours in a smaller setting to where they can bypass their freshman year? So that way, if they go off to Murfreesboro, they go to Chattanooga, they go to Knoxville, they're not sitting in those thousand kid lecture halls, those weed out classes, and that they've already gotten this with the support of having the high school staff here as well, that freshman year out of the way. Um, for families, I always tell them, so I was raised in Florida, um, if anybody's familiar with Florida, I, I did not know college costs money until I left the state of Florida. Um, so with the lotto scholarship, 100% of tuition and books are covered in the state of Florida if you make a 28 or higher. I went to UF. Um, I wanted to go to Auburn. My family said, we don't have any money. UF is free. Congratulations, you're going to Florida. So I did. Uh, but what I did is I was able to bring in 36 uh, AP credits. That meant that I bypassed Florida has 52,000 kids. I never once went to a class with more than about 30 kids in it. And that was because I did all the weed out classes while I was in high school, which meant that I was able to spend my 120 credit hours and I was able to do a dual uh, major in two different colleges. And so that's what I try to tell families when they're less familiar with why we would do a dual enrollment class. The other question we get is, is every student forced to do dual enrollment? We force no one to do dual enrollment, period. We do not force people to do dual enrollment. Now, we want to hear why you don't want to do dual enrollment, right? And so if you're like, nope, I just want to go straight into career, great. What are some industry certifications that we could help you get so that way when you go into career, you can command a higher wage, right? Like, so that's how we're trying to think of things with folks. Um, we, and, and that's where we're going with this. So again, we've got our rigorous, more rigorous and most rigorous. Right now, Dr. Hodges Johnson, the high school executive director and uh, Dr. Parrish are really working on that course catalog, but they are also currently interviewing for essentially an EPSA coordinator that will report to Dr. Hodges Johnson next year. And that person's full-time job will be to interface with these six different uh, clusters and the, the stakeholders in those clusters help hire, currently we're securing funding to have one graduate assistant per cluster. And so that person will really be in charge of, literally, please don't laugh, walking the 10th or 11th graders to their classes. If there is any type of a social emotional issue in any of those classes, instead of the professor having to deal with it or a TA, the graduate assistant would handle it. And then just ensuring that they're staying on top of their assignments and grades. Uh, so that way they know how to most appropriately take advantage of a college class in a college setting. We're going to talk very briefly about the current research projects that are happening. And then I'm going to talk a bit about what our current research priorities are across our university schools. And then I want to open it up for conversation. We are back in school with no masks and no social distancing post-COVID. And that is really driven by state policy and state law. Um, we really haven't had any outbreaks. Marcos and Kelsey are in our schools all the time. We have, I mean, do kids get COVID? They absolutely do. They also get strep, they get the flu, they get the common cold, right? Like they get things. Um, however, 
what we're noticing is it kind of reminds me of a scene out of a scary movie where like the tsunami has hit and then you have the aftermath and you have the survivors of the tsunami as we are seeing both from our students and our families, our faculty and our staff, some signs of post-traumatic uh, stress and secondary post-traumatic stress. Either they have had loved ones that have passed away, they experienced lockdown just like everybody on this call did. And again, they were an adolescent brain that was developing in the midst of an international health pandemic. What we're specifically looking at, oh, I did not mean to go there, is we are working on tra trauma-informed care with Dr. Susan Ellswick and really thinking through how do we help our faculty and staff take care of themselves so that way they can take care of others. Really, ever since we hit the ground running March 14th, 2020 with Google Classroom and Google Meets, of which nobody really knew how to work, our faculty and staff, not only at uh, university schools, but again, across the country, has been trying to take care of kids who are adolescent brains trying to develop in the midst of an international health pandemic. And we have seen a mass exodus across the country from the teaching profession from exhaustion. We have seen less of an exodus at university schools. And I think it's because um, I had a teacher from a former school I worked at see me in the buffet line at the first day of professional development. And she hugged me and said, I've made it to teacher heaven, right? And so we have that reputation which is good. So people, if they are leaving us, they're typically out of the profession altogether. They're not leaving for another school, but we still wanna make sure that we can take care of our folks and have the research that shows after COVID, how can we help set up faculty to take care of themselves so we can codify that and share it both with the academic community at large, as well as with other practitioners in the region and the state, so we can help stem the tide of the exodus from the education uh, profession. Beyond yeah, thinking about our teachers, um, we are working with, with Dr. Emily, haha, and Dr. Emily S is what I call her. Um, and we're really trying to think through what does school safety and climate look like? Um, so again, we just have mental health issues, both at our schools and schools across the country, because adolescent brains were trying, you're going to hear me beat the drum, trying to develop in the midst of an international health pandemic. And so Dr. Emily and her team are really working with us uh, through some really qualitative research and interviews to better understand what are the triggers that students and families are experiencing. Um, so really, if you think about Dr. Ellswick's work, she's more faculty and staff facing, and then Dr. Emily is working on really the student and family facing uh, aspects. Finally, um, I personally work in K-12, so I'm a little bit tired of hearing about learning loss, um, only because I think that our students and students across the country demonstrated learning gains um, in some things that we don't necessarily measure, like our students I watched kindergartners get themselves into Zoom breakout rooms in like September 2021 by themselves, right? Like, and then in there, where I was like, I would not have been able to do that in probably sixth grade. However, we do have some technical academic um, learning loss. Right now, every single grant across the K-12 space is focused on learning loss. That is what they are trying to measure. That's what they want to quantify. And um, this group, which is Dr. Christian Muller, Dr. Lily Yang, and Dr. Denise Windsor, and I saw Denise on the call, um, are really thinking about growth versus fixed mindset. And the way that I explain this to our faculties is there are two ways to get a horse to water. You can lead it to water, you can drag a horse to water, and uh, rectifying learning loss is going to be easier for us as a country if we can figure out ways that we can help lead students to be partners in learning loss recovery, as opposed to making it seem like it is one additional thing that is boring and disconnected from their overall growth. Those are our three current projects. However, what we're really trying to think through is we want to, again, be the laboratory for which we can do initial research and codification that we can then take to Memphis Shelby County Schools, our charter school partners, independent schools and suburban schools, as well as to the Tennessee Department of Education, so that the codification we do at university schools can be used across the 1,500 schools in the state to help us rectify the issues that we see in the community overall. So I've got one chat here, so I'm gonna look at that. Uh, nope, there was a private chat. 
complimenting me on my analogies. So I appreciate, I thought it was going to be a question, um, but thank you for the compliment. Uh, but I will pause there and would love to open it up for what does this get people thinking about? What would you want to know more about? Or where do you think that you could insert yourself, your research or your department? I can jump in. Thank you so much. Um, this has been really helpful. Um, and I, I'll actually chat you. I have a personal question about uh, who the best person is to get in touch with um, about the Montessori classroom. Mm -hmm. um, that's my sister-in-law. So I'll chat you about that so you don't forget. But um, we've talked and I'm trying to run some focus groups with the high school students and something that I haven't really had a great opportunity to ask about, but I would love to hear more about is what social emotional learning programs or supports are currently available to students across um, the different kind of grades or age levels. Yep, and I know that we've got um, a relatively large group, so I'm gonna speak slightly candidly and slightly not candidly. Um, <laughs> We have a member of our team, um, Mary Tucker, who is married to Terrence Tucker of the English department, who is our associate director of policy and standards. And her full-time job during session is monitoring kind of what's going on in session. So that way we know with legislatively what could be coming down the pike that we need to get prepared for. And one thing coming down the pike that we are potentially anticipating is a ban on social emotional learning and K-12 settings. Um, and so we are, we know that um, and we are aware of that. However, I think the way to like flip that is that we think about the fact that we've got three full-time social workers who have incredibly strong relationships with their student bodies. So we have a full-time social worker at high school um, who is Nakara McKenzie. We have Ashley Bowles full-time at University Middle School. And then we have Kimberly Jackson at campus school. Um, and then we have Char Wilson, who works out of that um, voluntary pre-K classroom, but really supports all of ELRC. And what we do is less of like a formal SEL curriculum. And what we try to do instead is build the relationships across the student body with their particular social worker. And then that social worker also is developing the skills to be able to really address what those social emotional developmental things are across the faculty. So they specifically join all of the faculty meetings, which happen weekly, but they really present at least once monthly at each of their faculty meetings about, without going into confidentials, right, here are the trends we're seeing across the student body. That means um, here is, if you think about it like a hurricane, before it gets to a cat five, here are some things you might notice with a tropical depression, right, like that you might not be trained to look for, but if you see that in class, let us know. It's easier for us, given the fact that we only have 100 high schoolers right now. We only have 300 middle schoolers, so they're able to help. But what they talk about is that the multiple sets of eyes are better than one set of eyes for them. And so that's really how they think about it. And then really what they're trying to do is both those proactive interventions for social, emotional, and development for our students, but then also the reactive once they have another set of eyes notice something. So we have a really not in an invasive way, but a see something, say something. Um, and I've, I've gotten to do it. I teach uh, journalism, media, and um, communications at the middle and high school one day a week. And I, I, get, I get trained by Ms. Bowles and Ms. McKenzie of what to look for. And then I've been like, hey, alert. I, like, I, you know, and again, it's something that if you weren't looking for it as a non-practitioner, you wouldn't necessarily notice, but because it gets put on our radar, and then they're able to follow up in a way that doesn't feel judgmental. But I mean, our kids go to them at all four of them across the four schools pretty frequently. Is that helpful, Amanda, or? Yes, that is. And I just wanna make sure I understood correctly. So the basically all of the social workers are kind of available to students across all the grade levels. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. And they do proactive programming, um, but it's not from like a formal SEO curriculum. Thanks. Yeah, that was helpful.
Just to compliment, uh, Josh, um, we're currently exploring a collaboration with high school, uh, between high school and middle school with Girls Inc. And they do have some of those programs. So but that's something that we are trying to project on the um, potentially for next year. Awesome. Hey, Josh, this, I'm going to jump in. I know you've had some uh, ch staff changes. If uh, interested in approaching university schools about a research project, are you the best contact to start that discussion? That's what I thought, but I wanted to put that out there for everyone. Thank you. Yeah, and um, Amanda, it's great because we were able to talk Monday, I think, uh, before the ice storm again, I think is like the appropriate word for, for what we are experiencing. Um, what I try to tell each of these three teams and Amanda is um, I am not a researcher yet. Like I'm, I'm exploring some doctorate opportunities, but I'm like a practitioner by trade and by heart. Um, and so what I can give you is like, here's what's happening on the ground. Here's kind of the temperature on the ground. Here's where people are capacity wise. Here's where I think you could fit in. Here's when I think it would be most advantageous to jump in. And so I really think of my role as more of like an air traffic controller. We are going to get you landed. You are going to arrive at the airport, but I will, I will offer suggestions of ways since most of these are voluntary to be able to maximize the voluntary um, pool of folks that want to participate. Naomi, I saw that you had a question in the chat. Did that answer the question you had? Um, if you could give any more details, that would be great. Like even who is the right person to reach out to for which age group and how to just get started in yep. the collaboration. They are, all four schools are trained that if they receive anything to forward it to me first. So just reach out to me. Um, and that's typically because I'll have a sense of what all is going on across all of the schools. And again, we'll get you set up, right? The other part um, that I can do is Marcos and I have both worked in the charter school and public school space in Memphis for a while. Um, and we have a lot of colleagues that are not at university schools, but are your more traditional like charter CMOs um, or at Memphis Shelby County schools or other suburban districts, including some independent schools who have also been begging us, like, how do we get involved in research? How can we get researchers from the University of Memphis to our schools? Do they have any interest in coming out into the community um, for that? And I'm like, yes, I bet they do, right? Like 100%. Um, and so what I'll also do that is able to do with Dr. Christian Mueller and his team was really think through, like, let's get started at University of Middle. Also, would you mind if I connected you with these three CMOs that I know are currently grappling with that? Um, right now that could also use that. I know Emily has mentioned like I'm connecting her um, with a couple of other charters where that would really have said, how can I get somebody to talk to our kids and families about what's going on? And then when Emily and I met, I was like, hey, look at that. You two should just go talk to one another, right? Um, what I'll tell you that you'll run into and Emily has run into is like, we are not at capacity. We will help, like we will communicate back. And if it, for any reason you don't get a message back from me, I'm pretty responsive. It usually means something happens. So just like reach back out. Um, but a lot of our partners um, out in the community are like stretched to capacity right now. Um, when they say that learning loss was real, it was real, but like the demands that have now come on top of learning loss are very real. And the fact that our teachers across the state and country are continuing to lead the profession in droves are real, right? But we are happy to connect you um, just to serve as an introduction point if you have any interest in getting out in the community as well. And that goes for Naomi and anybody. But yes, email me and then I will put it on my docket to uh, meet with our principals, get a sense of what makes the most sense for them and then get you in the door. That's really helpful, thank you. No problem. If there aren't um, any other questions, I want to thank um, Josh and Marcos, and I know Kelsey also joined us from the university schools. You know, I think 
what is happening is really exciting and know that faculty across the campus are interested in seeing how we can partner, not just on research, but on in other ways to support the schools. Awesome. This Thank you all for joining. I just wanted to say, Josh, Pam Cogdell from Counseling Ed Psych and Research. You all have been um, a training ground for our practicum and internship school counselors. And I really appreciate that connection. Ashley Bowles is one of our doctoral students in counseling. And um, we just great. We just really appreciate having that, that network. We appreciate y'all letting us have Ashley. Oh, I wanna thank also uh, Dr. White. I think she's right here. She's, uh, we're collaborating for an extended learning on hip hop. Um, so that's a really interesting. That's a different way of collaborating. If you guys uh, have something around, they are trying to have like an educational approach using hip hop and it's uh, research based. And Dr. Hunter, I think, I think he's mm -hmm. also in the process. So that's uh, not only research, but also trying to do all different kinds of uh, opportunities, exploring. So just, just let us know. Naomi, to your uh, question about the recording being made available, number one, yes. Um, I personally would like a copy of it as well so we can throw it um, in our like Google Drive so when people reach out to us, if they have questions, we can just send it on. Um, so I, for one, I'm gonna make sure that I get a copy um, of the recording and then hopefully they can send it out as well. Josh, can we get a copy of your slides as well, please? Absolutely. Thank you. Well, if there aren't any other questions, we appreciate, again, everybody joining in the interest today. I hope as um, if you have to be out and about that you say stay, say stay safe with our wintry weather that we've been having. Thank you, Janet, and thank you for the invitation. You bet. Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks.